Okay, so we're doing this series on the book of Colossians. And as you know, that um, Paul preaches in Ephesus. The pastor planter Epaphras probably gets saved and then goes back to his hometown. And he starts a church in Coloss. And then about 10 years into it, he's worried about some false ideas being stirred up in his little church in Coloss, which is modern day Turkey. And so he travels all the way to Rome where Paul's in prison and he helps. He says, Paul, help me out. And Paul writes this letter around 62 A.D. Hopefully you get a chance just to read it and just really think about it, because we're not only doing it here on Sunday mornings, we're also doing it in our life groups. Now, I want to show a I want to show a video clip. Uh, this is a, a Super Bowl commercial that was around 2015. But I want you to, to focus in on this. Then I'm going to talk about it. It's just one lemon and lime. Lemon skills are my favorite. They're my favorite. Let's settle it the usual way. Settle it the usual way! Settle it the usual way! So obviously you can see what the problem there was, right? That, that arm is distorted from overuse. Can you imagine if you went to the gym and you said, I need a personal trainer and I want to get in shape and I want to lift weights and all you did is work on that right arm or your left leg or just one part of your body and you looked like that. <clears throat> You'd go, man, I need to find a better trainer. The challenge is it happens in the body of Christ. We want to look at today a healthy body, and yet there are times when people <laughs> allow false teaching to creep in, and then the body is not the way it should be, or one person is doing a lot and others don't even get into the game. The big idea is that we want to building blocks for a healthy church. We want to have building blocks from this passage in Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. We're going to look at this idea that God has given us certain things. He's told us what we should be doing as a church. And as we work on these things, we'll be a balanced body of believers. And everyone who knows Christ can be in the game. This first building block is, is the word of the word encourage. I, I have an, a, a faithful assistant here. Ricky's going to help. You know, I feel like, what is it, Pat Sajak? And this is, this, is, this is my Vanna White right here. All right, thank you. <laughs> That's right, yeah. That was good. He's like, so much for encouragement. I told you I'd say things I regret. Okay, I'm sorry. But, you know, think about your own physical body. You need certain things to have a healthy body physically. Exercise, eating right, sleep. And yet the same is true with regard to the body of Christ. Let's look at uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, I want you to know, and Paul is writing this, of course, how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally, I want them to be encouraged. Just think about how you can have a ministry of encouragement for other people. I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and I remember <laughs> at age 10, I was starting to hang out with the wrong crowd. Stealing from stores, smoking, 10 years old. As I look back, I see that my older sister, Jan, was really trying to guide me away from that bad crowd. 
<clears throat> she brought me to the church she was attending, brought me to the Sunday school picnic, even bought me a shirt so I'd fit into church crowd. And she was influencing me and encouraging me when I got really close as an older teenager. She's like, it's really important <laughs> what you're about to do. You need to invite Christ into your life. Who is it that you can encourage? Who is the person that you can pour your life into and encourage them? And maybe letting them know you're praying for them. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25 says this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, we're not the type of church that says, hey, where were you last couple weeks? I know, some of you are ready to give me a Connect card, but that's okay. <clears throat> but if, if you are saying, I don't want to go, maybe that's the day you need to go. I don't want to be with the believers that day. Don't forsake. Come together and, and let people know the burdens that you're going through. Be there for one another. You know, it's interesting... <laughs> Well past quarantine, obviously, and that I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. But the week I got sick, I texted Jeff, and he goes, uh, don't you remember I'm on this cruise? So I go, okay, Jordan's next in line. So I told Jordan, like, on a Wednesday before Sunday, and he's like, yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. But that's, that's what the body's about, taking care of each other. It's amazing. So that's the, that's the first building block, is encourage one another. Think of ways that you can encourage fellow believers within the church here. The second building block is love. Is love. Thank you. Is love. Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 says this. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's, God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. He says it right here, knit together by strong ties of love. My mom passed away in 2015, but up until that time, she loved to knit. Now, in central New York... You wanted to have some warm slippers. And she would knit little booties for us. I'm a grown man, okay? These little woolen booties. Here you go, son. You can't say no to mom. She also knit a hunting hat, orange, okay? <laughs> and faithfully I wore it. But she would love to do that stuff. And this passage tells us that we need to be knit together with strong ties of love. Pour our lives into other people. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 and 20 says this, We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God and hate his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen can't love God who they have not seen. This past week... I was feeling better, and I went to this pastor's retreat that I'd been planning to go for a long time. And the pastors are coming from all over the country, and it's really a place of healing, and, and they, they're able to really share some of the challenges that they have. And there was one guy who said, I'm out of the ministry because people hurt me, and I'm, I'm so angry at them right now. He said, I even hate them. And, and some of the staff ministered to him, and he, after a day or so, he finally came to the end of himself. He said, now God is going to use me to go back to those people and tell them, I'm sorry. But it says right here, you can't say you love God if you hate your brother. He's talking to believers. If there's somebody in your life, you say, I hate that person. You can't say that you love God then. Figure out a way to reconcile with them. Figure out a way to forgive. You don't have to be best friends after that, but learn to forgive and let it go. Pray for them. The third building block is 
understand. Understand. These are going pretty quick. You're like, oh boy, it's going to be a short message, huh? Understand. Understand what? Let's find out. Chapter 2, verse 2 says, I want them to be encouraged, knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. Christ is the mystery, because think about this. Here is God who comes to earth, takes on human flesh, still being God, yet operating as a man, setting aside his God power. It even says that in Philippians chapter 2. He sets it aside. That's what it means to be emptied. He doesn't operate as God. He operates as a man dependent totally upon the Spirit of God. That is such a mystery. We can't comprehend that. And yet that's what scripture tells us. That's, that's why there are times when Jesus basically was surprised. When he was in the crowd and he said, who touched me? Because he had not stopped being God, but stopped relying upon his power as God. And he's like, who touched me? He found out it was a woman who had touched him and was healed by touching the fringe of his garment. There's so many mysteries in <laughs> In the scriptures with regard to Christ that we have to believe and trust by faith. Just think of the mysteries that you you may like. I mean, some of you like, I don't know, is, is Goonies a mystery? Help me out. Yes, yes okay. I never really see. Outer Banks, a mystery, right? Or my grandson, Scooby-Doo, lo he loves Scooby-Doo. Okay, my mom, when she was alive, she would call me up and say, hey, I need you to go to the library. And she read like all the time and she said you got to pick up 20 books i'm like what are you gonna read all these she would read a book a day i mean 200 pages just fly through it large print so you know maybe there's a lot of pictures too i don't know but i said mom why do you like mysteries she goes you never know until the end all the details of what's going on just think about it. We're getting bits and pieces of who Jesus really is, and someday we're going to see him as he is. And God wants us to understand this great mystery of Christ and accept it by faith. Verses 2 and 3 says this, For in him, in Christ, lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, I'm telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. So many times people outside the church, people who don't know Christ, say certain things. Don't buy into those ideas that are contrary to Scripture. Go back to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say about Jesus? Don't settle for those well-crafted arguments. There are certain arguments in our world, such as eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Another one is the idea that greed is good. No, it's not. Or that money will bring happiness. No, you just have more money, and <laughs> it's not going to make you happy. Or they have these ideas about who Jesus is. Go back to the scriptures and find out exactly what the Bible says about him. Embrace the mysteries of the faith. Next one. This fourth one is the idea that God wants us to walk with Christ. To walk with Christ. To walk with Him. It says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. You're going, well, I received Christ by faith. Exactly. Whether it was in a church service or through a friend. In my case, I was in a high school after years of reading the Bible and getting a gospel message through a tract that someone sent to me in the mail, and it was in high school in, my, in a hallway outside the study hall when I accepted Christ, when I trusted Christ, because my football coach had come to Christ, and I said, I want what he has. 
It's by faith. You trust in Christ by faith. So now we walk by faith. We live. We trust what God says about his word. A number of years ago, there was a pro baseball player that had just come to faith in Christ. And he was telling his coach, he said, Coach, I, I just want to walk with Jesus. And the coach said, I just want you to walk with bases loaded. But, you know, the people around us don't understand it, but God wants us to trust what he says, to believe him, to, to stay in step with the Spirit of God. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says this, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith. God tells us, Jesus said, I'm preparing a place for you in heaven. We believe that because it's going to be true. When you die, when you leave this earth, you're going to go, if you know Christ, you're going to go to be with him. We live by faith, not by sight. Trust his word. Trust the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you and direct your path. The next one. Keep learning. Keep learning. Be rooted in Christ. Colossians 2 7 says this rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith, as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Rooted in him is the idea of a word. It's, it's the idea that, that we are like trees. We're like a plant. And you have to ask yourself, well, how deep are my roots in Christ? I love Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. It says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of the mockers. There are people all around us who don't know Christ. Don't follow their ways. It doesn't work. Don't listen to their advice when it goes against Scripture. Go back to the Word and say, wait a minute, no, that's not right. This is what Scripture says. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. You just think about this word meditate is used of animals that chew cuds. Okay, what kind of animal chews a cud? Anybody? Cow. Cow. Okay. So when the writer of the Psalms is saying this, he is saying just like that cow that keeps chewing on his cud over and over again, you and I need to take God's word into our hearts and minds and then think about it, reflect on it. Let it become a part of us that you take one verse, you say, man, I just want to just think about this. Find a way to get God's word into your heart and mind and then meditate on it. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. He's talking spiritually. Whatever you do prospers. God's going to bless you when you obey his word. He's going to bless you spiritually. He's going to help you in your battles in life. He's going to give you the victory. Jesus <laughs> is to be the one that our roots go down deep into. That's what it says. Here's a, here's a picture. I'm going to put a picture up here. on this, this house is the house I grew up in. Yeah, there's snow on the roof. There's icicles hanging down. That's probably like December. It just gets deeper and deeper. Anyways, my parents built that house. And, and when I was a little boy, there was a seedling that came from one of the maple trees in the area. It just kind of flew into our yard and started to grow, and it was a, about a foot-tall seedling. And I remember saying, Mom and Dad, can I transplant this? Because it was right next to the garage, and I needed to move it. And I transplanted it into the center of the yard, and I'm surprised my older brother didn't trample it. He probably wanted to. We were in a lot of competition. I love him, but you know, you know how that goes. You've got brothers. That's the tree now. 
60 plus years later. It survived snowstorms and ice storms and wind and all sorts of heat and cold. I can't even put my arms around the trunk of that tree. How about you? Where are your roots? Are they going deep with Christ? That's what God wants. He desires for us to keep learning, to keep learning about Christ, to growing deeper and closer to him, to giving ourselves to him, to be teachable. Colossians 2, 7 says this, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Now just think about this. Are you teachable? Is your heart open to learning something from God's word? Is it, is it open to learning something from your life group leader? From right here. You could be attending church and going, yeah, I've heard this before. Are you open to it? Are you ready to receive what God has for you? You know, the challenge for the church, our church and every church I, I come across, not all of them are, but the challenge is to fulfill the Great Commission. That's the mission that Jesus gave us. And the Great Commission is lead people to Christ, baptize them, and then teach them to obey God's word. Teach them to obey God's word. Is there somebody in your life that's helping you with that, especially if you're newer? Or if you've been walking with Christ for a while, are you doing that with someone else? That's our mission. Make disciples who make disciples. Who are you pouring your life into? Friends, family, coworkers? Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 and following says this. The book of Hebrews... We don't really know who the author is, but the book of Hebrews was written to a group of Jewish believers in Rome that was under severe persecution. They were tempted to go back to their old life, even after they had come to Christ. And the writer basically challenged them. He says this, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others instead. You need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You're like babies who need milk and can't eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid, is, solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. If you've been a believer for some time, who are you pouring your life into? That's what it says. You ought to be a teacher. You go, yeah, but I, I don't have the gift of teaching. Okay, but you're still to be involved in the Great Commission in the sense of who are you teaching? Think about this. When you share the gospel with somebody who doesn't know Christ, you are basically teaching them how they can find Christ. You're just teaching them the basic gospel message. You're teaching them. When you share with a coworker or a family member or somebody that you're, you just are friends with and they go, well, how, what happened to you? You should be able to tell them, this is what happened to me. I came to Christ. Here's what happened. This is what I did. I trusted Christ. If you can't do that, maybe you need Christ. You share your story. You share the gospel. And you're teaching them, not in an arrogant way, but in a way that says, I am one beggar <laughs> that showed another beggar where to find bread. What have you been learning from the Bible? You can share that with others. It's really neat. At this pastor's retreat, we had this table time. We have, there was about 16, 17 guys there, and they went around, and each night at dinner, we would share some of the things that we're struggling with or what is going on in our lives. It was so neat to see the things that God was teaching them and how God was working in them in their churches and the hurt and the pain that they wanted to surrender to Christ so they could be more effective for him and his kingdom. But think about this. If you're married, your wife, you and your spouse, I should say, can teach each other God's word. You can give what you're learning to that person and say, man, I, 
this is what I'm learning. Or, and by the way, we, we always need workers in kids' church. Okay? There's a way to teach there. Or you can teach your grandkids. Or you can meet somebody for coffee. We're actually, as you know, as a church, we are working on doing a replant in Statesville, North Carolina, about 40 minutes from here. Craig Smith has been hired by us. There are four pastors. We're, we've recognized him as the church planter. But you know what God might do? He may stir up people either from our church or these other churches to say, I want to go help. <coughs> You're going to be doing their Sunday night Bible study starting in October. And you go, I don't have anything going on Sunday night. I could go help. I could be a part of this. I could do something with them to encourage. When we started our first church plant, it was so encouraging when people would show up and say, I'm not here to do anything unless you want me to. I'm just here to give you support. I'm here to get, encourage you and pray for you. <coughs> and so think about that. Maybe God has purpose or plan for you to help them in some way. Are you a lifelong learner of Scripture? Are you a lifelong learner that says, I want to know more of what God says. I need to know more. Because then you can recognize false ideas. Look at verse 8 of chapter 2 of Colossians. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the traditions or tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. In the intro, I talked about this, how this church was being taken captive by false teachers. Don't let that happen to you. Go back to the scriptures and go, wait, this is what God's word says. I'm not going to believe what they say. I'm going to believe what God says. The NLT says, high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking. I mean, the world says Jesus was just a man. That's nonsense. The, <coughs> the world says that there are many roads to heaven. That's nonsense. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. <coughs> These believers were being deceived, misled, falling into error because they were listening to what others were saying and not going back to what God said. See, this last building block is a result of a church, and I believe this church is doing this, is a result of a church taking care of each other, is a result, result of a church encouraging and loving and understanding and walking with Christ and, and learning. I mean, you take out one of these things. Let's say you take out love, and a church can have all the right doctrine if there's no love. Paul says you're like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. When there's no love. Thank you, Jeff. This is water, right? <laughs> <clears throat> Just making sure. But this last one, this last one, maturity. Maturity. And you think, well, I don't know if I'm really a mature believer. God wants you to be. He wants you to be a mature believer so you can turn around and help other people, so you can pour your life into others, so that you can help the body of Christ be what it should be. How can you do your part? It's not my job to tell you what God wants you to do with regard to service in the body of Christ. It is your job to go, wait, I want the Holy Spirit to show me where I can serve. Deb Rizzo came up to me and said, hey, we need more greeters. Well, here you go. You don't have to do anything. All you got to do is smile and give them a village weekly. I hope she has so many people she has to turn people away. There's an opportunity right there to serve. Don't be unbalanced. It is so easy to think that one person is doing more and more and more that, wow, that's great. That person's so busy. But then other people don't get to, they aren't in the game. 
God wants you to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Listen to this last passage, and as the band comes up, worship team comes up, let's reflect on this. Let's think about this. And, and think about where you are in your relationship with Christ. If, if, if you're not sure that when you leave planet Earth that you're going to be with Jesus forever, then you've got to make sure. Don't wait. If you know Jesus and you've been kind of drifting and you're kind of doing your own thing, maybe this time today, maybe today's the day where you surrender and say, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to stop leading my own life. Colossians and Ephesians were what they call companion books. Paul wrote them at the same time. There's a lot of similarity between the two books. Now listen to what Paul says in Ephesians about maturity. Ephesians 4, verse 14. Then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. People outside of Christ are going to have all sorts of ideas if you talk to them. When we should be sharing our faith with them, they're going to say all sorts of things. But you have to know, go back to the scriptures. Verse 15, instead, this is where you should be. This is where I should be. Speaking the truth. If you stop right there, then you're, that's not right. You just can't speak the truth. You have to speak the truth in love. Unfortunately, the church today many times just wants to love people and not speak truth. I love the approach that this church has. We want to speak the truth in love. We want to build relationships with lost people and then share the gospel so that they can see it's Jesus that will save them. No one else. Speak the truth in love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. I want you to think about your own relationship right now. Do you know Jesus? Or do you just know about him? Ask yourself a couple questions. If you were to die and you were to stand before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Would you say, well, I, I attended Village Chapel, and I grew up going to church, and I do good works, and I notice who's the Savior in that. You are. There's really only one answer, <laughs> is that I'm only here <laughs> because I trusted Jesus alone to save me. And if you haven't, if you can't answer that, if you think there's other requirements, then you need to just settle it today and not wait and say, Jesus, I want you. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. Give me eternal life. At the end of each service, we have people standing here on my left or my right who are ready to pray with you. And you can just tell them, I don't know how to, I don't know, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I, I want to know him. Please tell me how. Or maybe you're struggling with something and you need encouragement and you're like, I need somebody to pray with me. That's what they're there for as well. Or maybe you just want to talk to God alone right here, right at the altar, right in the front here. Just say, you know what? I'm just coming up and I'm just going to talk to God. I just want to talk to him because this is killing me. This is just weighing on me and I just want to surrender to you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus. We don't deserve anything that you have given us when we come to faith in you. And yet you said in your word that you have given us every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing. Everything we need to live a godly life, you've given it to us. You've given us your Holy Spirit. Help us to rely upon him. Help us to listen to him. Help us to follow your word. And not turn away from what you have given us. And if you don't know Christ... The gospel is so simple. That Jesus, God, comes to earth, takes on human flesh, lives the perfect life, never sinning, died on the cross for your sins, rose again. And what you need to do is embrace that. Open your heart to him. Why not do that right now? Just say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins. Give me eternal life. Thank you that you died on the cross and rose again so I could have eternal life. 
If you prayed that, and you invited Christ in your life, tell someone. Be willing to take a step and say, this is what I did. If you know Christ, and you know you've been struggling with certain things, and you just want to surrender it to God, why not do that as well? Lord Jesus, thank you that you will continue to do a work in us to help us be the kind of people you want us to be, to help us to be here for the community, to be a gospel light, a life-giving church. For your glory, in your name.